I just want to ask one more question, which is if there was substantiated re abuse, for, so for that line, yes, those children are likely no longer in the custody of their biological. It is my, my question is, is this done by the child? So if, if they were shown originally as substantiated abuse and they show back up in six months, are they likely in a different setting? And they show back up and say, you can't oh, tell that from this. You can't tell that, you can't tell that from this. So, so this doesn't they, tell you the placement of the child. child. So That's they right. They could either still be with their biological yeah. parent if they weren't removed, or they Absolutely. Be and this isn't distinct. This uh, to your point as well. This doesn't break down by perpetrator. So I mean, you could have, and this is not going to be the majority of these, but you could have the scenario just to illustrate your point, where you had a child who was the subject of a substantiated report at the hand of abuse or neglect at the hands of their parent or guardian. Now they're in foster care, and they were the subject of a second report at the hands of their foster parents. Right? Now, that is not typical. Those stories also make the news. But, and that's not going to represent the majority, but that does illustrate your point. And my point being, this data doesn't break all that down in this representation. Melissa, yes. Is there a place anywhere in the state that does rigorous data review, rigorous data review, like we would do in the hospital about quality? So this is what we have. Uh, and, and this is, does not represent everything. Um, so DFACS does this. DFACS is, is heavily overseen by the federal government. Um, they do a lot of their own internal processes as well to monitor, to be a, a student of their own work and to self-evaluate. There are external groups like us who do all of this as well. So that's kind of the, the range. Data, uh, unlike the healthcare industry perhaps, data in the child welfare system is really, um, has only really come about in the last decade or so. This before was kind of, you know, with the days of, in, t in the year 2000, we had a high-profile case I'll mention that we're familiar with, with Terrell Peterson. And the investigation in Terrell's death revealed we didn't even know how many children were in our foster care system at the time, and that was just in 2000. So the idea, again, and I start out with that comment, but I want to make that comment over and over. The idea of our system being performance-based and outcome-measured is a relatively new construct for child welfare. And so this is what we have, and this is what we're utilizing. We're becoming more conversant with it uh, and consuming more of the data around this and understanding more about the interdependence of these variables uh, and what all this has to tell us by way of a narrative for the performance of our system. Wilson, yes. A quick question. When you talk about substantiated reports, you mentioned um, that there was an abuse that occurred by, by, like, by a parent or guardian that they're living with, but doesn't that also include if it was someone out in the community? Yes, and it can. Sure. Depends on the definition of abuse. So some, various definitions of abuse have different features to them, and we, we're not going to have time to probably unpack the law today, but some are contingent on the parent or guardian effectuating that. Some are uh, allowance for third parties. But it would be calculated, though, if a young person was living with their parent, but it was an uncle that actually... Yes. But they would they remain with their parent. But that yes. Would yes. Yes. Is there another question? Oh, are there yes. different degrees that you uh, substantiate the no. So it's kind of an all or nothing thing. Substantiated or it's not substantiated. Now, one thing I should note about that, that family support track I mentioned, it, there is a, a return on that. So you can move kit, uh, cases out of, you know, investigations to family support and vice versa. So the point is if you go in with, a, if you will, a gentler uh, approach through that family support and you find out that there actually is, in fact, a serious safety threat, you can move that case to an investigation. So that you have the ability, again, to calibrate it. It's not that you're locked into one particular track. Okay. Let me show you this. So from a national perspective, this might get to some of your questions. From a national perspective, here's what we look like on that recurrence of maltreatment, that six-month measure we've been talking about on the safety side. And again, I will state again, this is not the only measure of safety, but this is a key measure of safety that we monitor closely. Yeah, it's a great question, an important question. A lot of people ask, doesn't six months feel too soon? Uh, the, your, the second part of your question is actually the answer to that. That what we find, So this measure, first of all, is a federally defined measure. All states have to report this data and track this information. Um, so that's, it's not something that's home cooked in any kind of way. That six month interval, this, this data is also monitored at 12 months and 24 months as well. But what is clear is what you said, which is the experience with it, these families is that when they are fragile and vulnerable, it's happening right now. It's acute. And so when you have a six month, that six month interval is actually more telling. We see things level out at 12 months and certainly beyond. Families become stable, right? So it's sort of, if it's gonna happen again, it's gonna happen again quickly, just as you said. Listen, do you, do you have a gut feel for, I know Mary asked you the question, but do you have a gut feel when it does happen again, at least on your experiences, what percentage are still with their family? 
Um, give, a gut, give a gut feel on it. I'd rather not give you a gut feel. I'd rather give you a data answer, and I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can get that for you. Is it very, very high? It, the, the, the second incident would be by the parent. Or, that, yes, yes. I, that's going to be the majority that, of cases. That, that's, that's, that's the fast. That's majority. going to be the majority of that's cases. Good enough, right? Yes, that's, yes, that's going to be the so majority. So we've left them in the family. Yes, or return them to a family. For example, and maybe oh, they man. came in foster care briefly and they went back home too soon. Uh, in hindsight. <laughs> So from a national perspective, again, on this measure, and this data isn't quite to time current, but it's, it's relatively recent, you can see where Georgia stands in terms of our competition among other states, if you look, want to look at it that way. Um, we're about half of the, the national um, rate here in terms of that recurrence of maltreatment, and you can see that Georgia is arguably leading the country among a, sort of a lead pack of states in terms of safety. This is important. This is, a, by the way, this is a difficult narrative. Again, when we feel the urgency of this work and you see the faces of children who've been hurt so deeply, like Imani Moss, we have a hard time believing this. Um, for good reason, right? You're confronted with an outlier, with something that's contradictory. But what I want to ask you to is be open to this and understand that this, on the whole, is something good we can say about our system and our ability to achieve safety for children. And that in many ways it sets us apart from other states. So when we're looking at other state models, important to know, you know, what are those trade-offs? Um, and how, do we, how can we keep what we're doing really well and then still embrace perhaps a new practice from a different state without compromising what we already do well? So that's the Child Protective Services side. Uh, and Erin, I am watching time, but am, are you going to, am I good? Yeah, okay. I don't want to belabor the, the agenda. So let's look a little bit now at the foster care program. So of course, this is the intervention of the state, the, probably the most intensive intervention by the state. This is something the state can only do when children cannot be maintained safely with their own families. And really, on the whole, in terms of the number of children and families with whom DFACS intervenes for short or long periods of time, only a small number actually come into our foster care system. And again, I would argue that, generally speaking, that's a good thing. Right, is that we want children with their families, provided they can be maintained safely there, and we just demonstrated some assurance that children can be maintained safely there. So we kind of have two, again, within this, oh, well, first of all, there's a separate handout. I wasn't able to include it with the presentation. And I also just wanted to leave this for you more with reference rather than going into it in detail, but I provided you a profile of Georgia's foster care system in terms of demographics, the age and race of kids, the gender of kids who are in our system right now, the number of kids, how long they stay, just some general dynamics, where they're at in placement, their reasons for removal into the system to give you a, a kind of a grounding in all of those kinds of things so that you know who these children are and who the families are with whom um, our agency is engaging. Probably a couple of highlights just while we're pausing on it, and we'll talk more about the total number of children in care. Median age. Some of you might suspect that the median age of children in our foster care system is actually quite low. We have a bunch of babies in our system. We have babies in our system, but the median age is actually close to eight, right? Um, we have about half and half in terms of male-female. You can see that race and ethnicity break out. That might not surprise you so much. Um, we don't really have, by looking at this data, and this is one simple slice of data, the ideas of the sort of the disproportionate minority contact. We actually have um, some of that in there, but you can see as well that there are equal, relatively equal representations of black and white children in our system. That might surprise you. Reasons for removal. 48%, as I was mentioning to you before in terms of proportions, 48% of the children who are in our foster care system, roughly, are there because of reasons of neglect. Now, with respect to this entire category of reasons for removal, a child can be in our foster care system for one or more reasons. So you might see you know, some of these have, uh, children would have several reasons indicated for their need to be in our foster care system. So you might have neglect and also substance abuse is a really common combination. You see inadequate housing. That also is sort of a form of neglect in some ways. You see incarceration, et cetera, and all of the abuse categories that are most typical to you. You can see a high number of children who are in our foster care system at least for one reason of parental substance use and abuse. That's significant in terms of our interventions with our families, that we're dealing with a lot of drug use um, in those families. Placement types, most of our children are with non-relative foster care placements. That's the stranger foster care, if you think about it, people who are unrelated, perhaps unknown to that child. Um, you see a number as well in relative foster care, and then we have some in, it's about 17% in our group homes and institutions, those congregate care living, uh, which are distinguishable from foster, family foster care because one of the setting, but also because they are overseen by professional staff. They're hired staff as opposed to families, right, in the community. That's the big distinction. And then you see a range of these permanency goals for children who are in our system. I mentioned that briefly. We'll talk more about that. How many are destined for reunification, adoption, guardianship, might age out, et cetera. 
So I leave this with you just as a quick reference to give you a sense of who is in our system. Well, as a house pre-adoptive home? Pre-adoptive home are families that are typically has to do with the conversion. So there are families who are willing to accept children who are what we call legally at risk, meaning that their parental rights have not yet been terminated, which is, of course, a precondition to having an adoption finalized. So they're somewhere in that status um, as opposed to having the final adoption. Yes. There are three things that are the reason for removal that don't necessarily come out at the time of removal. A lot of times we do not know about the parental substance abuse until we're further into the right. case. Secondly, we rarely find out domestic violence until we start to gain trust. And often we do not know about mental health diagnoses of parents until we're well into the case. So those are really important things to be aware of, yeah. but this data is not going to show. That's that. exactly right. Thank you for that point. That comment is exactly right. So there's a whole lot here that these numbers may go up. It certainly doesn't appreciate all of the nuance and the complexity of families once you actually get involved with them and some really difficult things to have to overcome when we're talking about mending families. I think that's really important. Yeah. I, I think what you said is the reason for the recidivism. If you have a, a second incident and you can't get that at the ah, beginning sure. of a case, but I wonder if you could do some profiling where a, a mother has been incarcerated and you believe that that is a high risk factor. Do you do any profiling like that? We're to just to beginning to. A little faster, but not six months. But yeah, we're just beginning to, and in a slightly different context, but maybe one that's more sort of acutely critical, which is around the child fatalities. So we're starting to look through its combination of kind of weaving and knitting all the data together, looking at what are the risk factors for a child to actually perish, right, to be a child fatality, and being able to sort of um, organize those factors on the front end so that when a call comes in and some of those allegations that are being reported by the neighbor kind of hit those sweet spots, if you will, then there's kind of an alert, kind of a red flag, hey, this case might actually meet this profile of a case that who is of a child who might seriously be at risk. And you might need to look a little more closely and probe a little bit further. That's brand new. There's only a couple of states, Texas and Florida, who have done that. Georgia is just now working on that. We're just beginning that work. But again, in many ways, leading the curve nationally and trying to explore what that might look like. And, and really, the, the, the more kind of, uh, acceptable term going forward in this type of work um, is predictive analytics. Yes. Google uses it, so they know what you buy. Right. Well, that's what <laughs> right. I'm saying. From Amazon, Sam, we suggest these books. Yeah. That's a predictive analytics yeah. platform based on your previous buying habits. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, looking, that's one of the things that we, that's where this public private partnerships may come into play in the future, is looking at predictive analytics and how do we utilize that to red flag uh, families that we know are most at risk for intervention before something. Um, and that's the opportunity, I think, where we have to, to mend some fences in the community because defects then can become a partner in helping a family go down, you know, or preventing them from going down that terrible path um, before you know, they reach that point. So predictive analytics is very exciting. Um, it is big data. There's a lot going on in this country around privacy and big data as well as so we have to tread very carefully around that. But we do think it holds a lot of promise for helping give information um, to a defects caseworker who's walking in line to a household situation and doesn't know anything about what's happening behind those walls. But the predictive analytics piece may give us some information because anything from parking tickets, you know, there's lots of information we can learn about the behavioral patterns. Yeah, and there are, I mean, I do think it's, it's sort of new territory, and so we're kind of navigating kind of the ethics and the privacy laws and all of the considerations there, but understanding that in certain contexts there's some value to being able to kind of mine that data and put together a, yeah, a profile, but predictive and analytics. That's right. That's right. And I, should, I want to speak for, on behalf of the department in this respect, and I can tell you because I'm directly involved. The department is, this is their priority, so this isn't something someone's, you know, required of the department. They're very much open to this and seeking out these kinds of opportunities to enhance their work through the use of data and technology and the wisdom of and experience of others, not me, people smarter, much smarter, um, who are able to help kind of figure this out.